Um, <laughs> welcome to Lunch and Learn. I'm Jennifer Zwilling. I'm the curator of artistic programs at the Clay Studio, and it is my privilege and my honor to host this weekly program and have all of these amazing people come together um, and just share some space and time and be able to see each other's faces. So thank you all for joining us. We um, we only are doing this wonderful program because of you and with you. So thank you so much. I'm just gonna start with a land acknowledgement. The place where the clay studio stands and where I sit today is part of the traditional land of the Lenni Lenape. We acknowledge the Lenni Lenape as the original people of this land and their continuing relationship with their territory. In our acknowledgement of the continued presence of Lenape people in their homeland, we affirm the aspiration of the great Lenape chief Tamanand that there be harmony between the indigenous people of this land and the descendants of the immigrants to this land, as long as the rivers and creeks flow and the sun, moon, and stars shine. Thank you to all of you. Um, we have lots of exciting programs coming up. Um, so just bef again, before I introduce Ade Bumi, I'm gonna let you know that we are getting ready for small favors. So that exhibition, which will have 300 works of art up in the gallery is gonna, um, go live on March 5th. There'll be a public um, virtual opening on the evening of that day. We are, um, I just have to say thank you to my colleagues, Josie Bachelman, um, Naima Stith, and Shannon Jones for organizing the 300 things. There are many, many boxes coming in. Um, Kensuki Yamato was our guest -er. Thanks to all the people who applied. Uh, it's a huge undertaking, but it's an annual event that we all really enjoy. So thank you to all of you for that. And to all of my colleagues for all the work they do, I'm so lucky to work at the Clay Studio and to be among our staff and our board members who I see on the call. So I just can't say thank you enough. I'm so happy. Thank you. Um, okay, Ade Bumi, I'm gonna introduce you and then um, we'll get into our conversation. Okay. Adebumi Gadebo is, I'm sorry, Adebumi Badebo is a visual <laughs> artist who creates sculptures, paintings, prints, and paper using human hair sourced from people of the African diaspora. Rejecting traditional art materials, Badebo saw hair as a means to center her people and their histories as central to the narratives in her work. Born in New Jersey and based in Newark, Badebo first gained recognition in 2015, exhibiting her first solo exhibition curated by Adrian Wheeler at the Paul Robeson Gallery at Rutgers University, where she earned her BFA, um, I'm sorry, she earned her BFA at the School of Visual Arts in New York. Badebo's work is included in the permanent collection at the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art, the Minneapolis Institute of Art, and the Minnesota Museum of American Art. Badebo's work has been presented in numerous exhibitions in the US, Asia, and Europe, including the Dhaka Art Summit Bangladesh, I-54 Contemporary African Art Fair, London, Minneapolis Institute of Art, Untitled Art Fair, Miami, Chachasma, New York, um, Morris Art Dodge Foundation, New Jersey, College of St. Elizabeth in New Jersey, amongst others. She's been written about in publications such as the New York Times, Hyperallergic, the Australian Sydney Morning Herald, Art Space, Ocula, Hypa Beast and Afropunk. Padebo's residencies include the Clay Studio, yay, and the Vermont Studio Center. She's been broadcasted on BBC Newsday and Talk TV Nigeria and has given talks at the Museum of the African Diaspora, Spence School, and the Newark Museum. Wow, so exciting. Welcome, Adebumi. Thank you. Thank you for having me, not only here, but at the Clay Studio. I was so excited to um, get the call from Claire Oliver, who is your gallery representation, um, that you were interested in working in clay and maybe needed a little assistance that we might be able to, to help you do that. So um, I have to say that having an incredibly talented artist who thinks about working in clay and then thinks to come to the clay studio is really an honor for us. So thanks again for being with us. Thank you. So Adebumi is a guest artist right now. She's working up on the fourth floor with um, the resident artists and staff and work exchange and um, has been getting a little bit of technical support, hopefully from everybody up there. Um, but I wanted to start just the way we often start these conversations by asking you about yourself and your art making. Um, and the question that I have been 
asking people is how and when did you make the brave decision to make your life in art? <laughs> I like that question. Um, well, I guess maybe my mom is responsible for that. Um, I grew up in Maplewood, um, right outside of Newark, New Jersey. So Maplewood, New Jersey, right outside of Newark. And um, at the time in the night, well, even before the 90s, but I was born in the 90s, um, the Newark Museum had a junior museum where they would give free um, art classes. Well, they just had a lot of free art programs for the community. And my mom at the age of three entered me into one of those classes where you, where toddlers would make art with their parents. Um, and my mom actually has a lot of artistic ability. I think she's actually a, a natural um, draw her more than me like I really had to work at it um, and she it's very natural for her so I just remember being really little seeing my mom sculpt clay elephants and do all these drawings and I was I guess like competitive against her like I want to do this um, but three she started me in art classes and it's kind of that's kind of been a constant throughout my life although I had a really um it kind of got overshadowed by me being an athlete. I ran track for maybe 16 years. Oh, that's uh, right. We, we talked about you coming to Philadelphia for pen relays. Yeah. Yeah. So I actually have been um, kind of all my life. I mean, my, I'm like second generation ran at um, pen relays. So track has been a really big thing in my family. But it's, um, I would like go to track practice and then go to an art class or go to an art class and go to track practice. And even my friend who I'm staying with um, now who's hosting me during this residency, I, she was like joking around Ashley Phillips saying like, I didn't know you could paint until you painted our track coach at our like high school banquet. Um, so I guess it's been a constant. And then in high school, when there's all this talks about where are you going to school? Where are you gonna major in? Is when I started taking um, that path more seriously and um, just being more intentional. And I went to a couple of schools, but ended off at um, the School of Visual Arts, um, practicing fine arts, majoring in fine arts. Yeah. And I know you had a, a little bit of exposure to ceramics before. Was that in your high school or in college? Yeah, so I guess um, outside of taking um, art classes in the, you know, the public school um, setting where, you know, sometimes the focus may have been on um, ceramics. So just learning the basics, like just building, um, coil building, kneading clay, using the kiln. Um, I also took private art classes um, by a, a woman named Evelyn Graves, who, is a, who was an art teacher and an artist mm -hmm. herself. Um, she taught a group of um, kids out of her basement for several years. Um, so I was one of those kids and we touched every medium so I think even, especially working with her and she's a collage mixed media artist, it kind of exposed me or opened up um, me using a lot of different material. Um, I think a lot of times people just go straight to painting and they don't explore anything outside of that. Um, but we were working with found materials, um, clay, um, learning about collage, um, building, you know, just a lot of different materials. So I think it made it very natural for me to pick up hair, <laughs> human hair. Um, but there's a more uh, concrete reason why I made that shift um, from more traditional art materials to black hair. But um, how I was exposed to art growing up, especially K through 12 made it really natural for me to um, 
really question the materials that were projected on me, especially in art school. That's so, um, I love the way you've um, worded that as well. You called it a concrete shift. So you used a material word <laughs> to describe changing the material and the ideas about the material. Um, so I think it's really interesting to hear it just from um, an anecdotal point of view that you took classes from this woman. It sounds like she lived near you and it was in her basement. Um, I, when I was a kid, I took dance lessons in people's basements. Like, yeah. it's so great to have these community situations where, you know, your mom heard about this opportunity and she made sure that you, you had access to that and that this teacher was so um, wonderful to show you all these different materials. And that it, um, it gave you, I mean, it, I think that you seem like an inherently courageous person, but it seems like it gave you the extra sort of, you're not afraid of a material which has yeah. really struck me about your work at the clay studio. You just have come in and you're like, well, yeah, I don't really usually work in clay, but I'm just gonna sit here and do this. I'm gonna like figure out how to create clay from the soil, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, but that, that's a really exciting idea and to like know how it, it was, has been built up is exciting. Um, do you wanna talk a little bit about that shift, the concrete shift? from mm -hmm. traditional to different kinds of materials? Yeah, so I think um, when I entered school, the School of Visual Arts, I was, although I was playing around with a lot of media, like I was doing sound installations, that was actually the last kind of series I did before working in here. Mm -hmm. um, I do think my predominant material was still paint. And um, I remember, it was my second semester of art history. So by this time we were, we went through maybe 500, maybe even 800 years of art history. Um, and there was no representation of any one of color, you know, not only as the subject, um, but as the, the author of these works. And when you're learning about that history, like art history, the canon in that formal setting, you really see that paint is the kind of dominant material that is um, that that kind of uh, tells that that history. Um, so I remember specifically, I was in a my second semester of art history class and the professor pulled up this painting um, called Olympia by Edward Manet. Um, and it was the first example of a black figure, a black subject in a painting um, from, at, off from two semesters. And the teacher introduced the painting as really radical and controversial at the making at the time that it was painted. Um, and in my head, I was like, oh, it has to be because of this Black woman. Like, she's the only thing drastically different about all the paintings I saw prior. Um, and the reality was she wasn't the center of the controversy or like the radical um, kind of reactions that it got. It was the other figure. So there's two figures in this painting and the other figure is this white woman who's reclined um, and nude. And it was controversial because this woman, Olympia, is a prostitute. And she was looking directly out at the viewer. She has her hand kind of crafts over her, um, her vagina. She has her shoe kind of kicked off. And my professor talked about her, the black cat in the painting, the lace, her shoe um, with more detail than the black figure, the, the other, the biggest form in the painting. Um, and I guess witnessing that, seeing how this history is, and I think also like that painting references another painting that, um, I think with 200 or 100 years prior 
So you see how just by using the material paint, it, it it's kind of loaded with this history that is in it. Um, and because, you know, I, I guess that that even how that work was introduced and how that woman who we now know as Laura because of the work of Denise Morell, who um, is now a curator at the Met, but she curated the show Posing Modernity that was at Columbia University. Um, you see that like, even with her being represented, she was still ignored. Um, and I think that whole experience of how that painting was introduced had me think about how, even if I were to continue and make paintings with black subjects and black figures, it will still be analyzed and critiqued within this white canon, um, within this um, history of paint, which has nothing to do with me. So for me, if I really wanted to steep my work in this black subjectivity, it not only came from the subject, but it had to start from the material. Um, so like for me, black hair, you know, it is our history. It, it is DNA. It is our body. Um, and then because I use human hair, my, the first step in my practice forces me to go out into my community and source hair directly from us. Um, <laughs> And, you know, and it, it's like this political, it like, because of our kink of our hair, it became this political material, this social, this cultural material. And um, once I thought through all that, I was also broke in art school. So it's a free material, um, you know, getting donations from barbershops and um, people who are donating, dating it, donating it through social media. So um, I don't know. I just ran with it and um, I guess eventually because so many people were giving me their hair with these stories about um, why they cut it or their, their ancestry because our hair is DNA, it started forcing me to look at my personal ancestry mm. um, and which led me to start focusing more broadly on True Blue Plantation which was um, in South Carolina, which is the plantation that my family was enslaved on. And that was kind of our beginnings in this country. It's, it's so powerful that you have that one moment in your art history class to like look at and how just that explanation of that one painting encompasses so much about what's missing and what you can add and, and, and yes, that idea of just like rejecting the traditional material of paint and saying like, you have to start again in a new place is really mm -hmm. amazing. Did you have like during that process, what was it that made you think of hair? Um, I think because I felt like the Olympia, the white woman in the painting um, so much of her controversy was um, about the gaze, her capturing or people being upset because this woman has captured the gaze, like how dare you have this prostitute, um, you know, be this kind of source of um, idolization and stuff like that. It, yeah. it, it, I started thinking a lot about beauty you know, and the fact that this black woman, Laura, in the painting um, wasn't seen as worthy enough to not only be looked at, but to even be explored, talked about, um, analyzed, you know, thought of. So I guess in that way, thinking about beauty, it forced me to look at the different ways that I've dealt with beauty in my own life. And I think that has been most apparent in how I've worn my hair, you know, whether I'm wearing braids or then perming my hair, um, you know, to have it straight and what that means as a black woman. And um, I had a phase where I was wearing weaves and 
um, or Afro when I started to like really embrace my natural hair and wear it, how it naturally grew out of my hair, which sounds simple, but it's sometimes is not so simple. Yeah, it's simple um, about any of this. Yeah. And, um, and I mean, now I have my hair locked. So I realized like I've dealt with my image and how I felt about my image the most through my hair. Um, and I think that was like the beginning thought. And then after that, thinking about black hair historically, not only in this country, but um, what black hair, our relationship to black hair on the continent in Africa and how um, it's so connected to like African spirituality. And I mean, there's a lot of um, cultures that believe that your spirit is in your head, is in your hair. That is a, um, a sacred part of your body. Um, you know, so just learning about that. And, and, and then I started reading a lot about the history of black hair. There's one book in particular called Hair Story where it talks about, I mean, it, it starts the history of black hair in Africa and then it kind of tells American history through the lens of hair, which is really interesting. Um, but it talked about how, because our hair was the closest thing to heavens, um, that there was this belief that our spirit was in our hair. Mm. Um, so I think, you know, starting off thinking about beauty, but then really fleshing it out historically and well, in all these different ways, um, I was like, this is a material that I think there's a lot to explore. And, and then also, not only was it a shift from working um, with kind of more traditional material and uh, here, but it was also a shift from working in representation to abstraction, you know, because black hair is already our body. Mm. I didn't feel the need to have to shape it or form it into something representational because it was our, it was like almost like redundant in a way, like it already um, was our body. So it kind of gave me the space to explore and play through abstraction, um, all these different ideas. That makes a lot of sense that idea that it's it's already your body so you don't need to make it look like a body yeah. Okay, there's a lot there's so much information and and history and the fact that it's both physical information like scientific dna cells and also cultural information and then you add beauty to it through what you're doing through making it into something that's um you know physically that we all are looking at and being moved by just it's really I keep saying powerful and interesting and important because I'm failing at my word choices but it's exciting to me um I'd love to have you show some images of true blue and talk about um that your trip there and how you found the the soil there and what inspired you and then eventually brought you to the clay studio so I'm gonna let you share your screen as soon as I figure out how to do that. One second. <laughs> okay, there we go. I won't take too long. But um, it's exciting to see the, the place. Yeah, so I um, like I said, I started really looking at my ancestry a lot. Um, you know, after using black hair for a couple of years. And um, my family at the same time was doing, especially, um, I'll give a lot of credit to one of my cousins, his name is Jackie Whitmore, who's been doing a lot of work on the ground of kind of um, bringing a lot of this history to our like families, like, um, just, consciousness and um, he, he's done a lot of work to uh, take True Blue Plantation in Fort Mott, um, which was an indigo and rice plantation and making it um, 
like just making, or I guess doing a lot of work that our family would still be connected to this land, especially because part of True Blue Plantation is True Blue Cemetery. So I start off with this um, newspaper clicking that Jackie Whitmore actually um, found, which I'm not exactly sure what year, but I know it was in the 1800s, True Blue Plantation went up for auction. So this is the, the article of the actual plantation up for auction. Um, and there's, you, if, if you could kind of make out the bolded True Blue in like the second paragraph, it was at 900 acres at that time. And Jackie Whitmore, my cousin, he used this article as one of the documents to prove that this land was his, has historical significance, which led to the historical marker being placed at True Blue Cemetery, where my enslaved ancestors are buried and um, their descendants. Um, so at the entrance of this cemetery, and um, as I've been at the Clay Studio, I've been looking more into like the history of these cemeteries on plantations and a lot of them are in the woods or areas that are kind of hidden in plain sight in a way um, because it wasn't a part of the practice uh, or not I shouldn't say the practice it wasn't um, just tradition to to have a official ceremony you know it's not like the slave masters granted their enslaved people um, a period to acknowledge the life of their loved ones who would pass away, you know, under the the grip of of slavery. So they would off. Sometimes the enslaved people would um, bury their loved ones at night in secret um, to just acknowledge their lives. So this cemetery is like kind of in the middle of this um, this forest and I mean here here's one of the tombstones and I actually have my hand on um, the headstone of my four time great grandfather um, and my other hand is actually on my mother who passed away in April um, so I have even recently buried part of her ashes in this cemetery. Um, but you could see, and this is actually kind of the most open um, part of True Blue Cemetery. But I mean, we walked around for hours looking for headstones that have just been engulfed in um, tall grass and weeds that have kind of taken over this space. So a lot of the work Jackie Whitmore is doing is trying to clear the land. Um, and part of True Blue is also, um, acres and acres and acres of cotton field. So although this land grew indigo and rice, um, it is now still kind of this space that creates immense profit um, for the people who own it. Um, so here's just kind of an image of the cotton field. And, um, and then across from the cemetery, across from the cemetery, is a church that my ancestors built at the begin after, right after emancipation. Um, and that church is currently a hunting club. So I have like a video of us um, literally trespassing to see something that my family built because we do not own um, we do not own that church anymore. It was kind of negotiated if we wanted access of, um, to the cemetery to continue to bury our aunt, our relatives that we would lose the church. Um, and I'll kind of fast forward, but you know, so this is the church that is a hunting club. And like, I emphasize that we had to trespass just to to get this video, um, which was a really dangerous thing because you're in the middle of a former plantation that is now owned by people that are growing cotton. Um, and it's a hunting club. 
<laughs> so I assume they would like shoot first and ask later. Um, so, you know, just the end of this video is us literally running away um, because we started, there were cars that were driving past and we didn't wanna be seen. So, um, you know, and as we were on True Blue, you, it's very hard to not be just captivated by how red the land is, um, which kind of brings me to why I'm even here. Um, so here's just the image of my friend Kelsey Jackson. Today's her birthday. Um, birthday. And Michelle Williams, who my um, art god sister and best friend who came with me on this trip to, um, to learn more about True Blue. But in doing that, we, I mean, this photo is not edited, it's true to color. Like that's just how red the land was. Um, and it was also interesting because you realize this is the land where all these, these, this fertile, these fertile crops grew from. Um, and so we were documenting it at one point. I even, um, and I think this was like the beginning of like, oh, I could really make something with this land. So here's kind of just a video of me realizing that with water, I could sh start to shape um, this land, which kind of sparked the idea that um, I should do a series in ceramics, which is how <laughs> Claire um, brought up that, you know, and um, from there, that leads me to the to the clay studio. You know, with that idea, my gallerist clay reached my my gallerist clay. My gallerist clay reached out um, to you, and um, I was really excited to hear that you guys also had residents and um, who knew the process of turning dirt into clay. So the picture on my left is my first batch of that red dirt into clay. And then the other image next to it are some vessels that were just like test vessels um, where, I, where I actually started shaping um, the dirt, the true blue plantation dirt to see what temperature I could fire it at. And I got, you know, just some examples of my work with here where I've been exploring True Blue um, plantation and the history of indigo cultivation in 2D. So this is also my first time in this True Blue series working in 3D. So here's like a close up image, a detail image. This is the full image of um, a, a, a print from, uh, I'm forgetting what year, you know, and it's seven by three feet. And some other examples of my work where I've explored true blue, so. Thank you for sharing all that with us. Um, I, I wanna note that in the picture of, of the pieces from the clay studio, there was one that was kind of upside down um, and you're, we were talking yesterday about the form that that is based on and you're, you're working through the material to try to figure out how to replicate that gourd form. Do you wanna talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so there was like, like you said, the, this kind of, it looked like a, a sphere shape with a skinny neck. Um, and that was actually the clay packed onto a, a gourd that, I brought back from Nigeria. So I'm Nigerian through my father's side um, and my mom's side, I took a DNA test, but, but vastly through my father's side. Um, so I, I think last year, no, two years ago in May, I went to Nigeria to learn how to make traditional um, Yoruba instruments. So one is the shakere which its basic form is a, a gourd, a regular um, gourd that is kind of has this woven um, beaded 
kind of net around it and you shake it almost like a tambourine and it it becomes an instrument. And then I was learning how to make the talking drum, which is like this two head drum with these chords that you press in and makes different tonal sounds. Um, so I made, I was only able to make one shaker out of the gourd, um, but my uncle let me bring back a couple. So I think I brought back six or seven gourds. And while at the clay studio, I've, I've been racking my brains, like, what am I going to make? And I had this idea, like, well, this is actual, uh, actual kind of vessel form from the continent. Um, so I've been thinking about maybe starting that as the foundational shape and just seeing how um, I can push it into kind of this new form. And when we were talking yesterday, I was talking a lot about like how at first I was like, oh, I should make cast of the gourd and then I could just make as many as I want. Um, but then a lot of the gourds will be um, destroyed in that process of making the two part cast. So then I've been thinking a lot about um, this idea of translation and what gets lost in the process and what remains and how that speaks or how that could be symbolic of you know, us in the diaspora and through um, the 400 years of slavery and how, you know, people are taken from their culture, their land um, and brought to this new space and the things that we keep and the things that we lose because of um, these histories. So I think, um, and thinking about that in terms of how I approach my process. So um, I did another um, gourd that I've been hand building and try and looking at the original form and seeing how my hand um, through the process of hand building keeps certain information from the original vessel that I look at and what it loses and how this gourd that I'm building now becomes this new thing. Um, and just thinking about that in relationship to the diaspora. Yeah, and that I think that relates back to your um, use of hair and saying that it, it's physically already representing your body mm -hmm. um, so that you don't need to make it look like your body. So in a, a parallel a bit, you know, you don't need to make the clay gourd look exactly like the clay gourd it's actually that how you change it that's going to represent those the changes that were necessary or that were forced on people when they were taken from their culture and brought to someplace else that they couldn't take everything with them so how did that change and, and become something new yeah. um, which is now part of your culture over the last you know your ancestors culture over the last few hundred years and there's there's beauty in that and where and showing that beauty as well. Um, it's also really interesting to use the gourd because they were, you know, used as musical instruments. And certainly there are clay musical instruments, but also I think the gourd form as a water carrier was has probably always been the basis of ceramic forms as water carriers. So there's like a very thousands of year long tradition between a ceramic form and a gourd form that's really and there's like um there's like a uh, negro spiritual song like one in particular I, uh, that like crosses my mind like the drinking gourd you know um where that song was kind of a code for you know follow the drinking gourd was code for following um you know the different constellations to escape um, to freedom, to escape out of bondage. So, and, and not necessarily, and, and that's not necessarily why I arrived at like, maybe the gourd could be the foundational form for um, what I do. And I still don't know, I, I have time to see if, I, if that really is how I approach whatever I make, um, but it does have even, um, a connection to, you know, slavery and how the gourd, 
was not only used, like you said, for carrying water, um, you know, utilitarian you know, purpose, but um, like this, this coded, uh, um, you know, information. Code, yeah, that um, was related to our liberation. You know? And that also speaks to like all of these different material choices and all the work that you're making has, you don't always realize exactly how much conceptual material is kind of lying underneath the choices that you're making, but it's so exciting to, um, I mean, and that's the research part of art making that not everybody understands. I think people outside the art world don't, when they hear artists say, oh, I'm doing research, it doesn't always <laughs> click. They don't understand what that means, but it's really just learning through the material and then connecting it to your, your concepts that you're just gonna keep finding new layers of information and yeah. being able to um, facilitate a little bit and um, just in terms of space for you to work with the clay and to, to visit you and hear your thought process as it evolves. And you said the other day, like you weren't sure what you were gonna make and you're, yeah. but you're learning the skills and you're letting all of these things marinate. And that's what's gonna um, yield continue to yield because it already is obviously amazing stuff. So yeah. I can also let everybody know, I think um, that we're excited that you'll be around through the summer. So we can, you can keep, you don't have to feel like you're rushed. You have more time to, to marinate. And there's a food word in there that I always manage to get back to the food words. Yeah, and I was, when we were talking yesterday, I was saying like how there's moments in my studio where I'm really like, cause I mean, outside of just little projects in sixth grade um you know ceramic is a new material so sometimes there is this like feeling of um being overwhelmed but then like i think there's power in the fact that like i'm in my studio and i am saying to myself what am i going to make from this dirt because in the same time this dirt which is dirt from a plantation and thinking about the trauma that happened on this dirt and the, you know, the lives that um, came from this dirt and the sweat that dripped into this dirt. And even the fact that my ancestors are literally buried in it, um, you know, and how, how, when their bodies decompose, what that does to the dirt, um, they didn't have a, choice of what came from it but all these years later I do so there's power in even the fact that I don't know but I can make that choice of what comes from this dirt from a plantation and you know and, and also you know when you were talking about research like research has always been a really major part of my process to the point where I even like hired a research assistant. So Anastasia Warren has been, um, we've been like even through my time at the residency, we've been having weekly meetings. And um, there's a lot of like one article in particular, I, um, it's called um, What the Sand Remembers by Vanessa A. Gard Jones. She wrote about, um, you know, what the sand in Martinique, which had, there's this beach where the sand is actually black mm -hmm. and how that black sand um, could be a repository for memory, memory about the different activities, mm -hmm. more specifically in her article, the, um, the different queer activities that took, took place on, on, on that stand and it's black because at the turn of the, the 20th century, there was a volcan volcanic eruption and the ash turned all the sand black. Wow. And I think they sh in the article it talks about, or the essay it talks about in a matter of 10 minutes, the entire community um, just disintegrated. Mm. So all the, 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 the people and the things that were happening 
has become the sand. Um, so, you know, looking at essays like that, and um, we were looking recently at research of how NASA is um, looking at Earth as a way to determine what life was there and the, the microbes that exist in um, soil and land um, and how the presence of water um, and different microbes in soil is an example of life mm -hmm. that is literally in the land, you know, where we, we may not think of dirt as living, but it is living when you think of it in that context and how they're using that as a way of um, determining what life is on Mars and different planets in, you know, our universe. So, you know, thinking of dirt as a living material, thinking of dirt as like, a repository for memory and kind of approaching, you know, based in certain research and like essays, thinking about soil in that context, not just as um, what it is, you know, dirt from a plantation, but what is in this soil, what memories, what stories, what life is um, a part of the makeup of this material <laughs> yeah and it's both physical and um spiritual like you're saying there's it's physically has your ancestors dna and physically has whatever sweat and things that fell from them but it also has the memory of of you know the emotions that were occurring above it and, and all of that connected um <clears throat> i i love that idea that you now have the power to make what you want and mm -hmm. you have the time to think about it and you have the um and you're using that privilege so responsibly by by thinking about the the research and all that came before and even just the way you always reference people who are helping you and then the name of the person who wrote the article I mean I just um I really admire all of those yeah and Nathan what's his last name he Williver Wilbur, he's the one who's been, um, he taught me the process of how to turn the dirt into clay. And it's fairly simple, but it's like, it's amazing. Um, and it's funny because I used to work at the North Museum and we would give tours and ask the children, like, how do you think the Pueblo Indians made these ceramic vessels? You know, there wasn't art stores. How did they get the clay? You know, just because we don't think of that. So I knew because of that period that like clay is dirt yeah it wasn't until i added water to the clay at true blue and i was like oh dirt is clay dirt. You know? <laughs> it's so amazing right it doesn't always come in a plastic bag and the, the <laughs> clay is the earth we stand on and it is what we are all made of and it is what unifies all of us too mm -hmm. and of course now you were talking about um, NASA and Mars. And so it, it really is um, not to get too spiritual, but you know, that saying that we're all made of stars. <laughs> it's really true. Everything is made of this matter. And at 3.30 today, the Perseverance um, Mars lander is going to land on Mars. It's a big deal, everybody. So you can watch it on nasatv.com or something. Um, so here you were at the red the red dirt road and the red planet is getting um we'll, we'll have the lander go there today so it's all related yeah. well thank you i'm gonna go to questions and because i know there's a, a a bajillion comments that have been coming in so i'll just go and read through them and find some questions if that's okay and anyone else who has more questions or wants to say something um michelle fisher who's joining us said that to, this is her moment of joy. This is from all the way back in the beginning. Thanks, Michelle. Jennifer Martin says, hello, everyone. Hope you're staying warm. Raymond, as usual, um, with links, he's putting links in the chat so everyone can check out Adebumi's website. Um, Janet says, hi. Raymond says, many contemporary art programs at universities are moving toward interdisciplinary training and exposing students to multiple media rather than focusing on one. Sounds like a good direction. It's good to see the results, great. 
Janet um, Samuel said, when I studied art history in the 70s and 80s, there were only a few women represented either. Yeah, we have a long way to go. We've got to explode the canon. Oh, and Raymond put the Olympia uh, painting in. Thank you. It was Titian's Venus of Urbino is the yeah. earlier one. Um, Robin says, erasure happens all the time. Kristen says, love your concept and gaze and looking up to black hair and black bodies. Snazzy Jazzy, who I have to learn her name, says beautiful. Robin says, beauty was always a significant part of our hair. Jennifer says, beautiful land and clay reminds me of my childhood and making mud pies. Yeah, I was gonna say like, to all the parents out there, encourage your kids to play in the mud. <laughs> play with the dirt. Robin says, gorgeous. You are love and inspiration. Um, Raymond put Nate's information in the chat. Thank you, Raymond. Robin wants you to visit her on Instagram at studio.potter and to direct message her. And I can give you her email address too. Um, Miller says, was is true blue in south carolina yes right yeah and for my, i actually look at two true blues so there's one true blue that my family was enslaved on and i've been exploring another true blue which is a golf club in Pauley island um so this plantation um in the 70s or 80s was converted into this luxury golf club um and kind of exploring how these two indigo plantations have become this other white space. Yeah. I'm just, I'm also really, it's interesting to me that they called it True Blue. That sounds, I said this yesterday, it seems like such a modern name for something. So um, on that, um, do I plan on incorporating the medium into the hair, to, into the ceramic work? So yes, I've been, um, especially that I, I haven't, uh, so yeah, the answer is yes, um, because I feel like this land is like this hybrid of the body and the land, not only because it took these bodies um, to, to, to build wealth in a way from this land, to grow from this land, like, like this land would not have been viable or valuable without them, but even now their bodies are in the land. Um, so I see like now these two materials, um, dirt and hair as um, I'm thinking about how to incorporate them together um, and create this like hybrid. So I, I eventually want to, right now I've just been trying to learn like how to build a, a symmetric vessel, you know, um, but I think as I get better in my t technique, I want to almost seeing the vessels I make as this hybrid of both. I was going to look for that. There's a picture of um, the felt fabric that you made from the hair and that you've sort of folded into, into a vessel. Um, so. Oh yeah, so I, I've made vessels out of hair. Um, so I, uh, you know, by by taking like hair, making it into like a mush, mm -hmm. um, pressing it, or even like the examples that I showed of the blue works, that is hair into to sheets of paper. And I mean, what you could do, I mean, clay, if you start from a slab or hair from a slab, it's a 2D form that becomes 3D. Yeah. So I'm excited you, to see how I could combine that process yeah you and you made that paper and you did that indigo dyeing yourself yeah mm -hmm. that was one of the questions um well there's so many i'm just gonna if you see one that you want to answer go ahead and i'll just keep looking too to see um whether we'll be sharing the results online for sure we maybe we'll talk again and hopefully we'll have other ways to ask, share. Will I be using the hair, um, or like as as the remaining imprint from the firing? Um, so one of the vessels I made just to test it out, I rolled a, a lock um, on the kind of surface of the vessel, to, and it picked up all the texture. Mm. Um, 
So, and I think, so I guess right now I'm just playing it. I even taken hair and dipped it into the thick, chunky, grainy um, slip mm. from the dirt and it kind of just crusted on the end of the hair. Mm. And, um, you know, maybe after the vessels are fired to actually incorporate the crusted hair onto like kind of like little nibs. I don't know. I, I feel like there's a world of possibility, but I'm using the fact that I don't know as like this powerful moment in my process that like I could decide. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of um, thank yous and a lot of this is amazing and inspirational and beautiful and um, sounds like people have some some technical ideas. Um, Janet is just saying that she's so inspired. Oh, and I'll be sharing things online as well. A show official as. I don't know is powerful. Yeah, it sure is. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think that that is a great way to end. We are so honored that you're at the Clay Studio and inspired by you. Um, so thank you for sharing your time with us. Yeah, and th thank you everyone for coming today to 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 this um to this talk and thank you Jennifer and the Clay Studio for having me. I've it's just been such an amazing experience to have access to everyone and the resources and the residents. Every time I go to the sink to wash a like a I don't even know what the the stick thing and the spray thing. I have a new resident that's like, oh, you should try this process. And I'm like, oh my God, okay, so I'll try that. So it's just been really amazing. Thank Great. you. We love it. So good. Okay, well, thank you so much, Adeva, me, and everybody who has joined us today. 3.30, um, watch that Mars rover land. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Bye, thank everybody. You. Thanks. Thank you. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> so nice to watch everybody. I know, and here you can you can hear them. Excellent. Okay, I guess I'll go. See Thank you. Later.